Somebody asks us how we doing, we just say okay, even when we know we are not. So I either say I'm okay knowing I'm not and be deceptive, or I turn angry and get destructive. And we find ourselves in situation where Jesus is in the building offering healing, restoration, but you got to come to terms with the fact that can I admit I am hurting? Do I stress? Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 6 and reading to verse 11. Have you found it? Yes. Is there a word there? Always. To God be the glory. He always has a word for our life. Yes. It reads, starting at verse 6, on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him, Jesus that is, to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath so that they might find the accusation against him. Even though he knew that they were think what they were thinking, he said to the man who had the withered hand, come and stand here. And he got up and stood there. And Jesus said to him, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at all of them, he said to him, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus came and said, stretch forth, stretch out your hand. And after looking around at all of them, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And after looking around at all of them, he said to him, stretch out your hand. Today I want to preach using this subject and thought in our, man, in our minds, come out with your hands up. Come out with your hands up. I borrowed this title from my dad. Come out with your hands up. My father, my dad, he loves a certain genre of movies called westerns. Any of y'all know what I'm talking about? Billy the Kid, Wyatt Earp, Clint Eastwood and them. John Wayne, and y'all, y'all, y'all know what I'm. He loves, he loves the part. He loves the part in most of these movies. There is a defining moment where the sheriff received news that the banditos, the bandits, have rode into town, beat everybody up on the way in. Y'all know how it go. Got to the watering hole, the local saloon, tied their horses to, to the outside post, went into the saloon and beat some more people up in there. <laughs> and the sheriff, the authority, gets word that there is a commotion in town. And he grabs his tools, gets his gun belt looks over at what is often a feeble-looking deputy, <laughs> off time scared, and said, come on, we're going down to the saloon. And when he gets there, this is the instructions that he gives. If they are going to come out and survive, if they are going to come out and everything be okay, if they are going to come out and this just be a side note in a broader part of their story, this are, these are the instructions that the authority gives. You can come out, but make sure when you come out, your hands are up. It is basic instructions. But I came to tell you on this Sunday, you can come out, but you got to come out with your hands up. Come on, y'all, y'all, let, let me build my case here. Let me. 
me build my case here, Brother Lowe. Let, let me build my case here, Deacon Mitchell. Uh, in, in our text today, this, this gospel of Luke, we find ourselves reading this story that was written some over 2,000 years ago. And Luke uses a powerful literary tool called biblical universalization. Yeah, I, uh, biblical universalization. I need, I need, to, need to teach y'all a little bit because I tell you all the time, you can't shout till you know what you're shouting about. <laughs> biblical universalization, this technique allows readers and hearers to see themselves in the story. The, the writer will present characters without specific names or detailed backgrounds, and by leaving characters unnamed, the narrative creates a sense of universality, encouraging us to place ourselves in the character situation. Y'all still walking with me here. It allows us to see our own lives played out in the gospel pages. So this physician, because he was a doctor by trade, this physician by the name of Luke says, as Luke chapter 6, verse 6 begins, that on the Sabbath day, there is, we are introduced to an unnamed man in an unknown place with an uncertain future. This is what we find out from the outset of verse 6. There is an unnamed man in an unspecified place with an uncertain future. And what is this man's dilemma that we are supposed to see ourselves in? Here it is. He's in church, but he got a withered hand. Can I, can I build my case right here? He's in God's house, but he has a withered hand. A withered hand means that his hand has died. But it wasn't always that way. Withered means that there was a point where this hand used to be vibrant. His hand used to be useful. His hand used to be functioning. His hand used to be capable. And even though it might have been ashy and needed some cocoa butter right in the cracks. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Sometimes lotion won't get it done. You got to get that Vaseline out. You get it. Y'all don't know what I'm... Even though it was all of that, there was a period of time where it was useful, but something happened. And what used to be alive, what used to be vibrant, what used to be capable, what used to be useful has died. And the thing about withering is, it's a slow process. It's not an overnight thing, it is, which means this thing that is attached to him that used to be useful, it died over time. Holy Ghost, help me to preach your word. Just like that unman, that unnamed man's hand. That's what has happened to some of us. Some withering has taken place. We may not have noticed the decline right away, but just like withering, it takes time. To die. It was a gradual loss of your happiness. Where you used to laugh easily, now you can't remember the last time you laughed so hard your jaws hurt. Because over time, your happiness withered and died. You were outgoing and, and talkative. You were the life of the party, but now you avoid phone calls and cancel plans and stay inside to avoid people because of what you're going through. Because over time, that part of you withered and died. It was your, it was the fading of your empathy. You used to feel deeply for people and sorry for people and help people when you could, but you've been stabbed in the back so many times, done wrong so many times, that that part of you withered and died. You used to be warm and loving. But you've experienced heartbreak one too many times, and now there's an icebox where your heart used to be. You wouldn't even like to listen to love songs on the radio anymore because that part of you has withered and died. 
It was the dulling of your ambition. You used to be so ambitious. You used to have dreams and goals and aspirations, but after a while, life beat it out of you. And now all those goals and drives of ambition have withered and died. You're just trying to make it from day to day. Just trying to keep your head down and be unnoticed. It was the shrinking of your confidence where you used to walk in boldly. Now you don't even care that you got crust around your wig. It That sense of pride in yourself withered. And died. It withers. And here's the thing. When something has withered, it, it died on the inside long before you saw signs of it on the outside. Holy Ghost, help me preach in here. And what we are seeing, what you are experiencing, is the external evidence of your internal issues. Oh, I'm on gospel assignment today. Have you ever seen those people in McDonald's going off over chicken nuggets? That ain't the, that ain't the chicken nuggets that make you that mad. That is, that is the external evidence of some internal issues. That there is something about that person on the inside that has withered and died. And it could be a small loss of your faith here. It could be a small loss of your joy there. It could be a small loss of your hope here, a small loss of your patience there. But after a while, something that God placed in your life that was useful, capable, and able died. It withered. It withered. And over time, it can become a, with a complete loss of function that you used to have. When I was, I got a new phone, not an iPhone. I got a new phone. And I had to send in my old phone. And before I sent in my old phone, I had to do something called a factory reset. And if you don't know what a factory reset is, it is a process that gets out all of the stuff that's been downloaded on it. All of the stuff that has been placed onto it and returns it to a state it was in before all the other stuff got attached to it. Lean in, child of God. Sometimes when we are experiencing witheredness in our life, it is calling for God to do a factory reset in our life. Before the issues got attached to your life, before the resentment got attached to your life, before the bitterness got attached to your life, before the hurt and the pain got attached to your life, God restore unto me. This is what happens. Here is this unnamed person. That's, that's me. That is, that is you that has showed up in church with witheredness in their life. And here's the issue. Verse 7 and verse 8 says that not only is Jesus in the building, not only is the man with the withered hand in the building, but the Pharisees are there too. Y'all don't know the Pharisees. You don't, you don't know. You don't know the Pharisees. The, the Pharisees, they, they were a Jewish religious party. They were a social movement that emerged about 150 years before Jesus was born. They are entrenched in the culture. And this is what the Pharisees do. The Pharisees don't necessarily believe in holding and lifting up the Ten Commandments as the standard. They believe in these unwritten rules. They believe in these traditions that keep man bound and keep man down and keep people in a place where they cannot elevate and be used by God. And they will place all of these restrictions and all of these traditions and all of these weights on people that kept them from being free. They want to put foot and hands on Jesus. And the reason they want to 
And the reason they dislike Jesus so much is because Jesus has showed up and he's setting people free. He's freeing people from the shackles of tradition. He's freeing people from the stereotypes that they had to grow up with. He's freeing people from feeling like they have limited futures. Jesus is freeing women from the stereotypes that have had them bound. He's freeing people and saying everybody is equal and everybody is loved by God the same. Jesus doesn't care if you're rich or you're poor. He doesn't care what neighborhood you came from. He doesn't care if you're messed up. He doesn't care what your issues and your flaws are. And people People are being delivered. And the Pharisees can't stand it. And the Pharisees don't like it. And the Pharisees hate what Jesus is doing. So in the synagogue, in a place of worship, in front of all of these people, here are the Pharisees. Here is Jesus, and here is this unnamed man in an unspecified place with the uncertain future. Are y'all still walking with me here? Jesus, understanding that the Pharisees don't want people to be freed, calls up the man and says, stand right here. When he calls up the man, stand right there, he looks at the Pharisees and says, so y'all got a problem with how I bless people. And you have a problem with how I free people. And then he tells the man, stretch forth your hand. Oh, this is where the story gets really good right here. Because you got to understand, there's a lot of social pressure. There is a big dilemma right here for this man if he's going to stretch forth his hand in front of everybody, especially in front of people that he knows are against him, especially in front of people he knows are going to talk about him. He has a dilemma. He has to come to church and stretch forth his hand and show his vulnerability in front of people. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And the right hand is the right hand. The right hand is a very important hand. This right hand is the symbol of strength and of power and authority and skill. In this culture, this right hand, it is what you will use for greetings. It is what you will use for oaths. If you are going to place your word, you did it with your right hand. If you were going to receive blessings or give blessings, you did it with your right hand. Your, your livelihood and how you made a living could be told by your right hand. What this man is dealing with, it is not some minor issue. It is a major problem. And in order to be restored, he has to be vulnerable in front of people. Hmm. He has to... If he shows his hand, he shows his weakness. And if he shows his weakness, he got to do it in front of people. He could have, when Jesus said, stretch forth your hand, he could have said, you mean this hand? The hand that has no problems, the hand that has no issues, the hand that can be used freely and easily, and you can't look at it and tell that it has any problems or issues. He could have easily played it off. You know, that's what we do. We play it off. Y'all ain't never seen? Y'all ain't never seen. You have, have you ever seen? Y'all ain't never seen somebody fall. And they get up and they don't hurt their side but they're trying to act like they're not hurt. So they're trying to act like they, like that. Like you can't see that they're hurting, but they don't want you to know what they're going through. They don't want to be vulnerable. They don't want to show that they have witheredness in their life. Because the Pharisees are watching. Because culture doesn't allow it. Because societal norms make it hard and it, call, and it can cause you at a place and at a point where you can receive your blessing, receive your miracle, and receive your breakthrough to act like there's nothing wrong. So you think you don't have a choice but to act like you're okay. You think you don't have a choice but to pretend like everything is just all right. Can I say something? 
in particular to the men because I can only speak from the, from the perspective of a man here that it is hard to be vulnerable and to show you have some weakness when you're a man. The two, general, the two general emotions we are allowed to have is anger and just being okay. So we oscillate between those two things. If somebody asks us how we doing, we just say okay even when we know we are not. So I either say I'm okay knowing I'm not and be deceptive or I turn angry and get destructive. And we find ourselves in situations where Jesus is in the building offering healing, restoration, but you got to come to terms with the fact that can I admit I am hurting? Do I stretch forth my hand? Do I show my witherness? Or do I act like everything's all right? Uh, this man has an option. Whether he is going to trust the Lord enough to come out with his hands up. Every last one of us have to decide how we're going to get through. Do you know that when Jesus shows up, they call one of, one of the many names of Jesus is the Rose of Sharon? I don't, I don't know if y'all, they call him Lily of the Valley, the bright and morning star, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, among the numerous names that they give him is one called the Rose of Sharon. The Rose of Sharon in close relation to another rose called the Rose of Jericho. Both of, these, both of these plants, both of these plants are known for this particular thing right here. They go through a season of drought where they shrivel up, wither, and look like they're dead. Holy Ghost, help me preach in here. And they can stay looking withered and dead for months, sometimes even years, where they look withered, worn, and dead. But the way God created them, is that they can stay looking dead for a long amount of time, but if they re-encounter water, the dead leaves on the outside fall away. And on the inside, you can see that there was something new that was waiting on the water to come. Can, can, I, can I help somebody in here? Because you may be dealing with the withered area in your life, but we serve a God that specializes in restoration. And when it seems impossible and when it looks impossible, God still has the power to bring withered places back to life. Why did Jesus ask him to raise his hand instead of just healing him? Because in verse 10, he calls him and says, you stand right here in front of everybody, and I want you to raise your hand. And my question was, why didn't you just move, Lord? You have the power. You could have spoken it, and it would have happened. So why didn't you just do it, Lord? Do you think the unnamed man is the only person in that sanctuary that needed a miracle? Do you think that he was the only person in that whole sanctuary that needed God to do something incredible in his life? His breakthrough is going to help somebody else get through. Y'all, walk with me here. I went, I had, a, I had something that I had to, I had something that I had to fix. So me and the kids went to Home Depot. When we went to Home Depot, I looked for the glue section because I needed something that was broken to be put back together again. When I got to the glue section, it was bigger than I realized it would be. There's a whole lot of different glues out there, y'all. And when I looked at this 
big array of all of the glue. I didn't spend a whole lot of time looking and reading at all of the other ones. I saw the one I wanted. I saw the one I needed. I grabbed it, and we started to walk out of the store. My son's being inquisitive asked me why I picked the one I picked and didn't take a lot of time reading all of the other ones. I told them that the reason I didn't take a lot of time reading all of the other glues and seeing what all of the other glues did is because that I seen my father had to put some stuff back together. And I asked my dad before I went what glue he uses. Because if it was good enough to put back together what broke for him, Y'all not walk with me today. Did I knew it had the power to put back what I knew, what was broken in my life. And is there anybody in here that can say the reason I trust in God's power is because I've seen what he's done in somebody else's life? I want you to know that sometimes the thing you have to go through in public is not just for you, it's God is showing somebody else. I thought I'd get a witness in here somewhere. God is showing somebody through the struggle you're going through, through the problem that you're going through, that God has the power to bring it back together again. I want to, I, 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 thank, I thank some of my friends that I've seen go through some difficulties in their life. I think some of my friends that I've seen in some of the lowest places in their life be vulnerable enough to tell me what they were going through because I watched how God blessed them. I watched how God brought them out, and it taught me. Because here's, here's what they would say in the old school church. Ain't no secret what God can do. What he's done for others... He'll do for you, too. So the devil wants your head lowered. The devil wants your hand lowered. The devil wants your faith lowered. The devil wants your praise lowered. But here is my chance, and here is my opportunity to say that the God I serve. He has power. Power, wonder-working power. It reaches to the highest mountain, and it flows to the lowest valley. And I'm coming out, and you're coming out with your hand up. So the man stretched his hand in the sanctuary. And I believe the reason he stretched in the sanctuary because if I can't be vulnerable here, I can't be vulnerable nowhere. If I can't go through here, I can't go through anywhere. My brother and sister, I've been in ministry for 29 years. And when I open the door of the church, what I'm going to do in just a little bit, I see the look. I've been doing it for 29 years. I see the look of that wrestle that when people are trying to decide, am I going to change my life right now? Am I going to be saved right now? Am I going to connect in a place where I can grow right now? I see that look of should I raise my withered hand or keep it down? That internal struggle and that internal wrestle that I don't want the Pharisees to know I'm going through. But listen, the Pharisees were talking already. The Pharisees had something to say already. And you're going to miss your blessing because you don't want somebody to know you're going through. You, you going through, they going through, he going through, she going through. We all going through. When I was... I, I, I remember. I remember when I when we had to when we had to rush my oldest son CJ to the emergency room. He had an asthma attack, and I remember we rushed into the emergency room, and we were in the wrong emergency room. This was the emergency room for adults, so we had to go. So they rushed us over to the other emergency room, the pediatric emergency room. 
And I, I, I remember checking in. I, I remember the nurse taking the vitals. I remember the doctor coming. I remember, I remember the look cuff. I remember the machines. I remember the room. You know what I don't remember? Who, who else was in the waiting room? Because I wasn't there to look around and see who else needed a doctor. I knew I needed a doctor myself. All of us in here need the same doctor. We might not need him for the same reason, but all of us in here need the same doctor. Your symptoms may be different from mine. Your, your pains may be different from mine. Your struggles may be different from mine. But we all need the same doctor. And in a moment, and in a moment, I'm going to open up the church door. And the devil's going to do everything he can to tell you to keep your withered hand down. But I want you to be brave enough and bold enough and trust in God enough to say, I believe that my breakthrough is waiting on me. And I ain't, and I'm not going to be ashamed of my withered hand. Can I, can, can I, can I tell you the last part? I go ahead and open the door of, of the church. The stage for this miracle for him to come out with his hands up. This whole stage, Sister Wolf, this whole stage was set at least 14 days before, the, before Jesus encountered this man with the withered hand. How do I know? Because I read the Bible. If you read verse 1 through verse 5, the part that happens right before this, it says that Jesus was walking with his disciples. They were going through a field, and the disciples picked up some wheat, rubbed it between their hands so that they can get the, the good part so that they can eat it. The Pharisees see the disciples doing this, and they say, hey, you're out of order. You can't do that on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is supposed to be a day where those kind of things don't happen. And Jesus tells them, you don't tell me what to do. bless when I want, how I want, where I want. It's called the theocracy of God. It means he don't have to check with anybody to do what he wants to do. He just does it. And so there's that encounter with Jesus with people trying to tell him he can't do that on the Sabbath. Y'all forgot already how verse 6 starts. I'll go back and read it for you. It says, on another Sabbath. Y'all, you, you just missed. It ended by them trying to tell Jesus what he ain't supposed to do. And the very next verse says, and on another one. It has to be, if we are being logical here, it has to be, it can't be the next Sabbath because Luke being a physician and very descriptive in his terms would have just said on the next Sabbath. So we know that it is more than seven days that have passed by. So we can reasonably deduce that it is at least two, two Sabbaths that have passed by, which means it is at least 14 days since the last time Jesus had an encounter on the Sabbath. Y'all ain't walking with me here. And if, it, and if 14 days have gone by since the last encounter, that means that at least 14 days before the man with the withered hand knew he would meet Jesus, Jesus had already set in motion the blessing that he needed. Yeah, y'all don't, you don't get what I'm, what I am trying to tell you is that before he even knew the Lord was going to work it out. Jesus had already set in motion everything he needed for his breakthrough on that day. Yeah, okay, y'all. What I am telling you is that before that day ever got there, Jesus has already set in motion the blessing and the breakthrough that that meant. Y'all not. What I am trying to tell you is that before that day got there, Jesus had already set in motion everything that that man needs. Do you know what that means? That the only way he missed his blessing is if he was not brave enough 
to lift his hands. And I, I, came, I came to tell somebody on this Sunday that the Lord has blessed us to see that the breakthrough is already yours. You just got to be brave enough and bold enough to say, I'm coming out of this. And I'm coming out with my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise. And is there anybody in here that can say, I lift my hand in the sanctuary because I know that the God I serve is able to do exceedingly and abundantly and he will restore everything in my life that the devil tried to steal. How do you know, Stackhouse? How do you know that God has restoration power? I'm glad you asked today because the God I serve, the God I serve has been mighty, mighty, mighty 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 good to me because the lord will be a bridge over troubled water and the lord will make a way out of no way i'm gonna lift my hand and say yes he will yes he will yes he will yes he will yes yes Come on and give it to the Lord. Come on and give it to the Lord. Lift up your praise. Lift up your praise in the sanctuary because the God we serve has the power. Everybody stand to your feet. The door of God's church is open. Everybody stand to your feet. The door of God's church is open. Come out with your hands up. Listen, if your soul isn't saved, this time is for you. And it's always interesting. A lot of times when one person comes, that it's like that gives the courage to others. But don't wait on somebody else to move. Don't wait on somebody else to come. If your soul isn't saved, sister, you ought to come. If your soul isn't saved, brother, you ought to come. Jesus wants to, Jesus wants to save your soul, to love you, to wrap you in his love, to protect you, to guide you. And if you're here, you are saved. Come on, you hear him knocking on the door of your heart. Don't wait on somebody else. Come on and get in a hurry so that the Lord can save your soul. Come on and give God a hand of praise. God is ready to save you. You ain't got to fix nothing up clean anything up. He'll take you just as you are. You ought to come today. Come on, brother. Come on, sister. This is the place where you can be honest and vulnerable in God's sanctuary. All of us need the same doctor. We just need him for different reasons. But all of us need the same doctor. And if you're in this space, but you're here without a church home, if this is the place where God is inspiring you to come, we welcome you with all the warmth and love of Jesus Christ. But you ought to come today. You ought to come today. We're going to sing while you make your heart up. We're going to sing while you make your heart up. You ought to come, my brother. You ought to come, my sister. Come and let God change your life. Sing, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I believe Sing, yeah. Yeah.
Amen. Listen, it's almost time for us to go. But if you are in this sacred space we call sanctuary, and you know your soul is not saved, you ought to come out with your hands up. If you know that God is calling you, knocking on the door of your heart, my brother, my sister, you ought to come out with your hands up. If you know that he, this is where God is saying, listen, it's time for you to, it's time for you to get in church. It's time for you to have a church that you go, grow, learn about God, learn about who you are in Christ. Listen, my brother, listen, my sister, you ought to come. They're preaching with outstretched hands. They're not down here to ask you your, your business, to get into your background. They're just here to accept you with the warmth and love of Jesus Christ. So listen, I, I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. Do you know that you could be standing right in the very vicinity of somebody that is on the cusp of changing their life for the better? You didn't know. You didn't know that God was going to place you right in their vicinity, but God did. So I need you to help me to help your neighbor. I need you to help me to help your neighbor. They could be on your left, your right, in front of your behind. Could you just find somebody? You just find somebody. You just look at him and ask him, do we need to go down? Come on, come on and help me. Find somebody ask him, do, do we need to go? Do we need to go down? Do we, do we need to go? I don't want you to miss. I don't want you to miss your chance to come out with your hands up. Okay? Do we need to go? Do, do we need to go? Yeah. Chapel Church and Pastor Stackhouse it is with pleasure that Isaiah Hogan is here to join the church today. And we welcome him with all the warmth of love. Jesus Christ, Louis Chapel, say hey. hey. Listen, the door of God's church never closes. The door of God's church never closes. If you still need to give your life to Christ, if you still need to join God's church, all you got to do is go to lewischapel.org. When you get there, at the top of the screen, there's a place that says join. You can click that. You can uh, give your name, email, or phone number. I cannot wait to reach out to you. But whatever you do, don't talk yourself out of. Don't let the devil talk you out, out of what God is in the process of doing in your life. Listen, I want to pray. I want to pray. And I'm inviting you to come to the altar. I'm inviting you to come to the altar. There may be a withered place in your life. And we're asking God to move in a mighty way for the blessing, for the breakthrough, for the healing, for the anointing, for the thing. Don't look around to see who's coming. Be like the man with the withered hand. Just, just come and draw near with faith. Yeah, preachers, y'all, y'all turn the face this way. Y'all, y'all turn the face this way. Eh? If you're here, if you're here by yourself, that's fine. Come on. If you're here with your family, grab your family and say, "Come on, we getting down. We going down to the altar." If you're here with your boo, grab and be like, "Come on, let's go pray." If you're here with your friend, tell your friends, say, come on, let's get down to that altar and let's pray before we go. If you need, and also if you need to still join the church and give your life to Christ, I'll be standing right outside. You can let me know right out there. As we shake your hands and talking, Reverend Stackhouse, I need to give my life to Christ. Or I need to join God's church. Uh, right over here at the music pit, there'll be somebody with a red sash on. You can go over there. You know why I do this? Because the door of God's church shouldn't just be available in this small little window of time and then it's over. So that's why I try to give as many ways and as many options and as many possibilities. Because when you're really in the process of trying to change your life, the devil don't want you to do it. He wants you to stay stuck and bound and down and mean and regretful and all those other kind of things. But Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. 
And there's no reason, my brother, no reason, my sister, that before you leave this place and before you leave holy ground, you can't receive the restoration of Jesus Christ. Oh, I know I'm right about it. Let us, let us pray, let us pray. God, I thank you for this place that we call Lewis Chapel. This, this place, God, that has been a refuge in the time of storms. This place, Lord, that reaches out to the community so that we might do your work. This place, Lord, that when we're weary, worn, wounded, and sad, that we can come and connect with you, God, you who are our resting place. I thank you for these people that are so kind and so loving. I thank you for you, God, that you give us mercy and new mercies day by day. Now, God, there's, there's some, some of us that are in the process of receiving a breakthrough. And in that process, God, help us to trust in your will and in your way. To not take anything for our journey and not give up that all things are possible because you have the power. God, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. And we know that there's nothing too hard for you. So move in our life. Move in every circumstance and situation. And God, we won't wait till it's over. We won't wait to see the results. We're trusting you so much that we'll thank you before it's even over. We'll shout hallelujah, God, before you've even made the way because we trust in you just that much. God, bless our friends, God. Bless our families, God. Bless our enemies, Lord. Give us your strength. Give us your wisdom. Give us your guidance. And when the cares of life seem to press us down a bit, we will rest if we must, but we will not quit. And now unto him who is able, to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before his Father with exceedingly great joy. To the one wise ruler, he who is maker of both heaven and earth. To God, thou who art our creator, to Jesus our Savior, and to the Holy Spirit our comforter. May this Trinity rest, rule, and abide henceforth now, forever and ever and evermore. And the church said, Amen. God bless you, Lewis Chapel. God bless you, Lewis Chapel. I love you. I love you, Lewis Chapel. I'll see you Wednesday.